Joe Biggs is here with us, and he's told some of this already, but since he's here with us in studio, for radio listeners and also TV viewers watching on PrisonPlanet.tv, I thought that we should walk through all of this uh, again, uh, what led up to Michael's car blowing up, the Rolling Stone associate editor. And the reason I made a big deal out of this is, in the past, the media would go look and see if this was foul play. Uh, just out of hand. Instead, day one, they said, you don't say it could be foul play. That's a conspiracy theory. And then just more and more comes out. The car not speeding as fast as they said. The flash of light. Uh, then it clearly it, people going and looking at the tree, including our reporters we sent to L.A. The tree not even really damaged. It came to rest up against it. The engine uh, blown out the back way down the road. Uh, all of this stuff. Uh, and, and the fact that he sent an email saying basically, they're after me, I'm going to go into hiding, get ready for the feds. And some of uh, Michael Hastings' other friends that have talked to Joe Biggs, and of course uh, Joe got the email uh, where he said he was basically going into hiding and had a big story he was about to break and get ready for the feds to come. Everybody else was too scared to even release that email. And let me tell you, folks, when it's not an inside job or foul play, they come out and say we're doing an investigation for a couple weeks. And the car blew up. We don't know what did it. When it's suspicious, they go, no foul play. This is completely normal. Happens all the time. Nobody look at this. Uh, the feds weren't talking to him. He wasn't working on a big story. There's nothing happening here. Just, just move along. When you see that type of behavior, ladies and gentlemen, that's when the red flags go up. And I've seen them kill a lot of journalists, Gary Webb, you name it, the Arkansiding of people. Uh, this is a really serious issue, and persecution of press all over the world is a big deal. So Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs, uh, good friends with Michael Hastings, they kept in contact with each other in the years after uh, they'd been in combat together, um, said, I'm going to stand up for my friend. He went to the memorial on the East Coast. Uh, was there, uh, she came up to him, I and mean, he really told the story in detail yesterday, and specifically told him, I'm going to bring down whoever did this. And then to see her up there all glowing, oh, nothing happened, move along. I mean, folks, this is really getting getting serious. And uh, if, if they can kill Michael Hastings and nobody investigates it, then they can kill Alex Jones, they can kill Ron Paul, they can kill Matt Drudge, they can kill uh, Breitbart, oh, I guess he's dead. They can kill whoever they want. And at a certain point, if more people start dying, I don't know what we're supposed to do, because, you know, I'm not looking to start a fight here, but and I know it's a big shadowy government and things, but, uh, you know, at a certain point, we just can't sit here while death squads run around killing whoever they want. Uh, now, uh, Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs, you heard me just lay out some of the basics of what happened, but getting back into it, talking about remembering Michael Hastings, and just repeating what you said about him in combat compared to all the other press you ever saw, and then how scared he was. In your own words, repeat what you said last night to the cameras, on record here live on air, for our own safety, because I want to get everything out you said last night here live on air, because I don't want to sit on this tape while we're putting it in the film, and then you know we both end up uh, having our own little explosions. Well, like I said before, 2008, uh, I find out that uh, we're going to get another reporter in bed with us, and, you know, like me and the rest of the guys are kind of like rolling our eyes like, oh, great, here we go again. Another, another, you know, reporter coming out here saying that they're going to be uh, all hard and hard charge, and then they're, you know, dedicated to working on their stories and doing all this. And to, you know, when he gets there, it was just a, a whole different persona of what I just had, you know, in my head from all the other guys. He jumps in there and he's just like, you know, what are you guys doing? What are you working on? You know, how could I help? You know, what's the best way to, you know, portray what's going on? You know, so we get out there and we finally get on. He, gets, he goes on a few missions with us and he actually was involved in a pretty big one up on a uh, mountaintop in Pakistan. And we came under attack and, you know, like I said before with other reporters, they would just whimper down and they would, you know, you know, like, why did I do this? I want to go back home. I didn't sign up for this. You know, and Michael's just sitting there with this grin on his face, and I'm looking over at him. And I just remember kind of sitting there shooting my M4, and I'm looking over, and he's just looking up at me smiling with the camera. And he's like, is this it? Is there more? You know, he just had that intensity, that passion about what he did. And you described there's A-10s, helicopters, mortars going off around you. Oh, yeah, there were A-10 warthogs coming in. We had helicopters shooting hellfire missiles. It was, it was just complete and total chaos. Controlled chaos, I guess you could. It was like a scene out of Apocalypse Now. 
Yeah. That's one of those things that you kind of, you want to see when you get in the military, but then it happens and you're like, wow, this is not like the movies. This is so intense. Like, there's so many parts moving, you know. You know, the guys on the ground calling in for the airstrikes, the artillery, the, you know, all this stuff trying to get clearance from Washington. Can we use a C-130 Spectre gunship? You know, can we do this? And they're like, no, we, you know, it's not important enough, all right? Well, there's like 300 of them and 30 of us. I think that's pretty important, but <laughs> the A-10s took care of it for us. But, you know, Michael was just that guy. He, he didn't shriek back from the fear. He loved it. I mean, he was just a go-getter and an adrenaline junkie and definitely right up my alley, my kind of guy. Uh, I think there was more to this guy than meets the eye. I mean, he marries the head spokesperson, of the PR flag, the PSYOPs officer of the National Security Council. That's the top of the pyramid worldwide uh, because you've got globalist interest and in, in, in banksters that own things. But the, the, the United States National Security Council is telling NATO what to do. It's telling the U.N. what to do. It's making all the decisions. I mean, that's the top of the pyramid. The ISORON, that's right in the middle of it. He marries her. Two years ago. Yeah. Love, I guess. <laughs> uh, Love will do crazy things to you. And definitely, uh, it's definitely not one of those, uh, you know, a matchup you would think, but, you know, whatever. Amazing. Uh, I mean, repeat what you said yesterday about uh, leading up to this, talking to her, and then when you're in that restaurant, your buddy goes, look up, she's on CNN. And, I mean, just your whole take on that. Yeah, you know, from the get-go of... How he was in Afghanistan, courageous, you know, brave, strong kind of guy. You know, all he did was speak the truth, and he didn't let anybody hinder, you know, that. He didn't let anybody kind of, like, persuade him to change his stories, his words. He spoke the truth, and that's just how he was. So I get the, you know, I get this email, and that email, you know, you sound so scared. And it just didn't sound like the Michael that, you know, myself or anyone else knew. When you said you talked to his other friends who physically talked to him, he was looking to, I'm going to repeat all that. The feds had come to the house, looking under the car. He, you said he was scared. Yeah, he had uh, LAPD and then some other people had come by the house, could have been feds. Like, like I said, at that point, there was a lot of weird things happening in the days leading up. He, you know, he was seen looking under his car with his brother. Um... His other buddy, a mutual friend of Mike and I's, uh, said that five days out, he started speaking in code. He was just panicked and on alert, you know, just seemed like he was constantly looking over his shoulders left and right. And I knew he was like that in a sense because what happened with the McChrystal story. You know, he'd called me a few times and I'd spoke to him and he's like, you know, I'm kind of scared. Well, you told me. People were telling him, we're going to kill you. Yeah. I mean, he even wrote that in one of his books. I mean, he, he pretty much came out and said that they said that. So, I mean, he definitely... So the biggest killers in the world say we're going to kill you. Your car blows up and it's not suspicious. Yeah, I mean, everyone just wants to crack up to be some accident. I guess it's easier to sweep this away and sweep it under the rug than to actually dig in there and ask the questions. And a lot of people out there just don't want to get into it. But, you know, it's not going to stop me and some other people I know that are still curious and still have all these unanswered questions, and we want to find out what's going on. Well, like you said, Mike would do it for you. Oh, of course. Mike would do it for anybody. I mean, that was just the kind of guy he did. Anything, any kind of, you know, unjust act that happened, and he didn't feel right about it. He'd get that gut feeling. I mean, he's going to look into it. I mean, he was going to find out what was going to happen. I can't just not, you know, I didn't choose for the email to come to me. I, you know, I would have saw that and... And like, you know, what's going on and definitely still been curious about the whole thing. But it came to me and I would I didn't ask for it to happen. But I got this feeling I, I had to do something. But before I even released the email, I started contacting the other people that were on there and I'm asking them, Hey, don't you think this is weird that we got this email and now he's dead? Like, are you guys or BuzzFeed gonna do anything about this? And then the response I got was, You know about this? Question mark, question mark, and then that was it. And I kept emailing them back, so what are we going to do? Nothing. So I started asking around, you know, I asked my mom for some advice. I was like, you know, should I should I say something? And, and my mom was like, I don't say anything. She's like, that's some scary stuff. I thought about it for a while, and I was just kind of like, you know, my gut tells me I've got to say something. So I started contacting different people, and, you know, KTLA was the one who responded. So I forwarded them that email, and... Now, you know, most people aren't thinking this is an accident anymore. They're kind of getting that feeling that I had from the get-go. That's right. You brought the, the, 
the fact that he was going into hiding, that the feds were coming after him. They didn't want that in the equation. They wanted everybody to be scared. Yeah. But one guy stood up, and now more and more is coming out. Get into... I mean, repeat what you said uh, yesterday when we were taping in there for the film about you know what she told you at the funeral then versus what you saw on CNN and what you think might be going on there. Yeah, I, I went up to Vermont with a, uh, a mutual friend of Mike and I's and uh, stayed with them. And uh, we went to the uh, memorial service. And we get there and I kind of do a walkthrough, you know, shake his father's hand, his mother, his brothers, and sit down. And it's just kind of one of those sad, you know, it was just, it was, it was nice to see that many people who cared about him show up. But it was just kind of a sad, just overall. Solemn. Yeah. So I walked, I was like, hang on, I got to get out of here for a second and get, get a water. So I'm walking out, and as I walked around, Elise came around, Michael's wife, and said, Staff Sergeant Biggs. And I turned around, and she goes, come here. You know, I'm just sitting here thinking, all right, this could go one of two ways. This could be like, uh, uh, thanks for, you know, bringing this to light, or, you know, this isn't into your business. Why did you release this? I mean, really, it could have gone either way. Well, he sent you the email. Yeah. So she actually comes up to me, and she's crying, and she hugs me and says, thank you. She starts talking to me about how Mike had spoken about me many times, and I mean, she knew more about me than I knew about her. I mean, she was just going from story to story from Afghanistan and the conversations we would have, and she knew everything about me, you know, and I was kind of put me more to calm, and then, you know, after she wiped the tears away, you know, she got that, that pit bull look, and she, she told me, you know, we're going to find out. She's like, I'm going to find out who did this, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to, like, roll over on this. This isn't an accident. I will find out who did this. And that was pretty powerful for me. She said this wasn't an accident. Yeah. And and then fast forward a month later. You... Yeah, well, then I tell her that I'm going to go to L.A. and do some investigating. I want to look around and find out what's going on. You know, I had a whole checklist of things I wanted to, you know, cover and go over. And we have some potential suspects. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I think she was threatened, but keep going. So I send her that, and at first she's like, okay, that's fine. You know, she just seemed all, you know, dandy about it. It seemed like, yeah, whatever, you know, go do it. You know, that's your friend. You can find out whatever you want. You know, I'm going to do what I'm doing and investigate on my side, and you do what you want to do. And then the next day, I just, I wake up, and I'm I, like, I took a nap, and I had like four or five long texts. That was right after you've been on my show. Yeah, four or five long texts, and, you know, like, don't go to L.A., don't do it, don't do it, please don't go. And I text her back, I was like, why? She's like, just don't do it. it I don't, you know, I don't want to get into it, just don't do it. And then I called because I was like, you know, my heart started pounding. I'm like, all right, why the big change? And uh, when I called, she didn't even answer. Someone else did, this lady, saying that it was her friend, you know, and I could kind of hear her off in the background. And they were just like, you know, Elise doesn't want you to go right now. Please don't do it. Cancel the, the whole trip. And so, I mean, you know, you hear... A widow, you know, like that, and then the. So you called me. It was, I was I was just in two reporters with you at least. Yeah. And a former NSA guy who investigates these things, and you said, uh, "Let's wait two weeks." So we wait two weeks, and I didn't even know she was going to be on. I texted you at about nine at night. I was putting my kids to bed. I texted you, "Hey, you know, how are you and her doing? You heard anything new?" And you go, "What are you talking about? She's on TV right now." Yeah. <laughs> so so let's fast forward. Where are you right then when I'm texting you? I was actually having dinner with a buddy, a buddy of mine, Spencer, and, uh, you know, we were just actually kind of going over some stuff I was talking about. He was asking me, you know, what, what are some new leads in the story? You know, have I made any progress? And next thing you know, he kind of nudges me, and he's like, you're not going to like this, but look up. And I looked up at the TV, and, you know, it's Elise Jordan, you know, Piers Morgan, and I just kind of got this sour gut feeling. I was like, uh, what, really? And then the interview goes on, and then she just seems happy. She's saying this is an accident, and I, my stomach hurt. I mean, I pretty much paid the bill, got up, and left. I just couldn't even stomach to be there, and not even until the next morning that I actually, after sleeping on it, did I even watch the, the video on YouTube. It was definitely a, a 180 change from how she was to this whole other. Well, I think clearly she was threatened. I mean, I, I, that's the that's the prime approximation, or like you said, you know, maybe she wants them to think she's not investigating or something. But undoubtedly, a major reporter goes into hiding and is dead 24 hours later in a suspicious death with a car blowing up. I mean, this is 
And now the police tapes have been released with witnesses saying I was driving down the road, it blows up, and then goes off the road into a tree. That's what all the other witnesses said. Yeah. So it just keeps piling on. I want this to be a regular crash. I don't like knowing they can come do this to me at any moment. I mean, it's not like I want this to be a government murder. What are your sources saying he was working on? Well, as we all know, it was, like I said from the get-go, it was the CIA. More... Now that's coming out, yeah. Yeah, so people are starting to, you know, come out and say that. The other things as well were uh, he was in direct contact with Barrett Brown, who was arrested in, what was that, 2011 in Dallas? 2012, somewhere right there? Because I know he's been in jail for about a year now. Uh, Michael was talking to him. That was the CIA guy. He was the guy that was working on Project PM who was uh, doing a lot of computer hacking into the government that they were looking, they were doing mass spying on yeah. Americans. And he kind of uncovered a lot of that, and then they raided, the FBI raided his house and put him in jail. So but he was also talking to a former CIA guy who was in North Africa who they put in prison. He was talking to a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he had a lot of things going on, but that Barrett Brown thing was a definitely key thing because... He even got a copy of the warrant that had all the arresting people involved on there. So, I mean, that, that in itself, the McChrystal thing, this, looking into the CIA, all these things add up to, you know, there's a lot of people pissed off at him. Well, uh, they killed uh, Aaron Schwartz, too, undoubtedly, who was really giving him trouble. We're going to come back from break, and I want to talk about... Uh, why he changed because you talked about this yesterday you know usually he was a lot nicer on tv he wasn't as in the weeks before he's like we got to get them the government's evil we got to get together they're bad they're coming after us and he was like i'm gonna break something big i mean what was it think about this what was it he learned that wasn't just oh they're spying on us or something what had freaked him out i think it was 9-11 I, I mean my gut tells me he, he broke into the big stuff and because uh, that's the big i mean i interviewed Barry Jennings was the deputy head of New York Emergency Management on this show. And he said, no, they blew up Building 7. They had bombs in there. They told me he was dead two weeks later. I mean, just dropped dead. And the family moved out a week later. It was like some witness protection deal. In fact, some say that he probably staged his death and put him under national security. We'll be right. I mean, I interviewed a lot of people end up dead. Uh, Joe Biggs here with us. Uh, good friends with the now deceased uh, Billy Patriot for the First Amendment, uh, Michael Hastings. Um, talk about, I mean, repeat what you said yesterday uh, uh, in your own words about the change you saw in him in the weeks leading up to his death, and now you said you've gone back and reviewed the videos. I mean, there was real, real concern there. Yeah, you know, when when this all happened, I was very suspicious of everything, so I kind of sat down, and I was like, all right, I need to go over a checklist. I need to create how he was, what things are happening now, you know, what I know, and then try to start trying to put the pieces together, see if any of this leads up to anything at the time. You know, this is just, you know, the days after. So I got on YouTube, and I was like, you know, I think I'm going to start looking at a lot of his recent, or, you know, interviews from starting about a year back, and then I want to start seeing them up until I, I watched his last one that was on the Young Turks, I believe. And, uh, we got to do something. They're coming for us. Yeah, you know, like, you know, the first interviews I'm watching, you know, he's, you know, he's very calm, and, you know, you know, Obama's great. We're doing all this good stuff, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, you know, towards the end, it's like, you know, they're, they're trying to keep us from, you know, saying what we want to say. They're, they're going to come after us, you know, if we speak the truth, you know. And he just, his whole persona just shifted, and he went from, you know, being this calm person to. Like you said, apparently finding something out in that time frame leading up to his death to where he just felt like, you know, the press was under attack and he needed to be a hard charger. He needed to just, you know, stand up and people needed to see that, you know, it, it's affecting everyone out there. That's a normal response to tyranny is to act like that. People go, oh, it's so strange. That's how you're supposed to act when your country's being overrun by crooks. What, do you, what does your gut tell you he was discovering? I mean, we know it was CIA, it was government hacking, it was, but I mean, is that enough to make him act like that? I mean, he, he was working on many stories, multiple stories, of, as we've said. I mean, any of that altogether. I mean, the stuff with Project PM is a big thing for me because all that hacking stuff that Barry Brown was involved in was, you know, bringing to light that the government was mass spying on, you know, reporters and all these people. So I think that probably is it, because he was like, they're persecuting the press, they're coming after us, we've got to stand up against them. Yeah. And, and so I think that probably was it from what he said on that last interview. I mean, that's all it could be. I mean... 
I'm, I mean, to have that kind of job, to have that, his name's out there. He's a big person, you know, as far as, you know, worldwide known, you know. So to be, to see that kind of stuff, to see that our government's going to try to, you know, hush hush everyone, that definitely, you know, is going to upset you. And, I mean, that's definitely what happened. We're going to go to break and come back and have five more minutes. It's been great having you here in town. We'll finish up discussing that. But, um, I'm not calling the Young Turks out because that's not what I do. I mean, I call, I'll call people out for what they say that's wrong. But they said they were such good buddies with him. They've gone with the official story. Like all these so-called liberals that were friends with this guy have just gone with the official story. The, 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 that's some great friends to have there. Let me tell you. Some of those guys that work there, though, even reached out to me. And they're the ones that helped me confirm that Mike had to have the cops come there. You know, the people had visited him and the... Talk. Okay, well, then maybe I missed it. Have they done shows on that? No, no, no. I, they haven't said anything. They've just told me in emails. You know, that's what they have said back. That's even worse. Yeah. So they're out there in L.A., they know about all this, and then, they, and, and then they're not doing anything about it. See, that shows they're not just dumb liberals. They're scared. And if everybody gets scared of the tyrants, they're going to take over. Don't people get that, that only free people that have courage will be free? If you're scared of tyrants, they'll take over. Unbelievable. That just blew me away. Wow. We'll be right back with the final segment with Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs.